Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Can you hear me? No. Is that any better if I come closer? Yes, it is. Excellent. So let me give you a very warm welcome to this evening's Royal Philosophical Society lecture. My name is Adrian Bowman. I am a council member and I have the great pleasure of chairing tonight's event. Thank you for making the effort to join us through rather challenging weather and welcome too to those of you who are listening in online. Let me deal immediately with the usual housekeeping issues. For those of you who haven't been in the building before, there are toilets downstairs and an accessible one outside in the foyer, uh, fire exits from the main entrance and the signposted door at the back. And finally, a reminder, if you wouldn't mind, switch off your mobile phone. I will do the same uh, so that we have no embarrassing interruptions. Thank you. Now, our first lecture of the 2023 to 24 season, if you recall, discussed the rise and fall of the dinosaurs, highlighting, among other things, the huge changes brought about by major climate change. Our second lecture dealt with the extinction of the great auk, with human activity uh, bringing significant changes to its environment. Forgive me for pursuing the ornithological metaphor, but this evening in our third lecture, these themes come home to roost, so to speak, not in the past, but in the present and the near future. Climate change is one of the most challenging issues that we all face. And one of the consequences commonly mentioned is the possibility of significant human migration. So this evening, we have the benefit of hearing from Professor Neil Adger, who is a world expert on this topic. He is Professor of Human Geography at the University of Exeter. A clear indication of his scientific standing is the extent to which his work is highly cited by other scientists. He studied and engaged with many different aspects of migration and in places across the globe from Bangladesh to the Somerset levels. He's been a coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so he's uniquely well-placed to speak on the issues of tonight's lecture. Neil, I congratulated the audience on winning through against today's weather. Uh, so I'll thank you even more for having made the journey from Exeter by train today very successfully and completely on time. That's a real achievement. Um, I should also say that uh, at some point during uh, uh, towards the end of Neil's talk, you might hear me shout out. That's not an expression of dismay at the content of the lecture, but an instruction from Neil to give him a little signal on the timing of uh, tonight's events. So thank you very much for coming, Neil. It's a great pleasure to invite you to give tonight's lecture. Thank you so much, Adrian, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming this evening. My thesis this evening is that climate change is going to affect the economic geography of the whole world, every corner of the world. By that, I mean it's going to affect what we do, how we uh, live our lives, what we make, what we trade. And the result of that, the result of this changing economic geography of the world because of climate change will affect where we live and where we move. And this is a profound consequence of climate change that we might not notice, we might not notice it on an everyday basis, um, but is a long-term process of change in terms of our settled settlement patterns, where we move and decisions that we individually make uh, around this. I'll also suggest uh, this evening uh, that climate change related migration is already happening. Um, it is happening even uh, the, even in places uh, that you wouldn't expect, and certainly in places that you would expect um, climate change to be a big factor in terms of migration. But it's not the dominant thing that is driving mi migration at the minute. It's not the principal factor that is driving migration, because migration happens everywhere, and it happens all the time. 
um, and it is as natural as breathing. But uh, it may become, it may well become a more dominant factor in uh, how migration happens, migration as a social and demographic phenomenon in future. So although it's not uh, a major factor at present, it may become, it may become more so in the future. This also has profound consequences, uh, I would argue, on what we do, how we plan our cities, uh, how we cooperate globally, and how we plan for this changing economic geography. So uh, let's just uh, start by thinking what we mean by uh, migration. There are north of uh, 7 billion people in the world, and quite a lot of us are migrants. I'm going to speak about migration uh, in the, uh, as a social scientist, as a geographer and as a demographer would. So in some senses, it's a technical term, and it means nothing more than moving your permanent place of residence across a jurisdictional boundary. So if you think about it, um, you, uh, many, many people in the world are, in the, in, uh, in that, by that definition, a lifetime migrant. Now I have an admission to make, and my admission to make in front of this audit, in front of you all, is that I've never lived in Wales, but I have lived in the other three nations of the United Kingdom, uh, and according to the Office of National Statistics, uh, that does make me a lifetime migrant. I've lived in a couple of other countries as well, but it makes me a lifetime migrant. Um, and so if you think about your own uh, situation, so it depends where you draw these jurisdictional boundaries um, uh, in terms of definitions of what we mean as social scientists whenever we talk about migrants and migration. It doesn't have to be across international borders. In the public discourse, probably in your minds, when you think about migration, you principally think about people moving across international borders. Um, and so migration, is conflated with or is only really thought about in terms of international migration. And again, in the public and political discourse around migration, uh, the consequences of migration are thought about in terms of identity, in terms of multiculturalism, uh, in terms of social cohesion, in terms of people fleeing from war and per persecution. Um, uh, and also some, uh, uh, elements of this in terms of the economics of migration, uh, in terms of its effect on labor markets, it's a depression of wages for the places where people are moved to, issues around brain drain, uh, people, you know, uh, countries and regions losing skilled, uh, skilled workers. And all of these factors are completely relevant and are really important uh, ways that we, uh, uh, dimensions of migration are, import are completely important things to talk about. But when I talk about migration here, I'm going to be talking principally uh, just about that decision to move from one place to another. And all of these decisions to move, of which there are, uh, which are all taken uh, individual, taken within households, it's a sort of bargain between people within households, uh, have consequences. And all of them are affected by climate change going forward. So again, we're speaking here at the Philosophical Society, I just want to, to make sure that we are defining our terms very well before we uh, start off. And that's what I'm uh, going to be talking about. So just to put some flesh on this and the sort of scale and the scope of what we're talking about globally um, is that we are a much more mobile world than we realize. In our day-to-day -day lives, we're a bit sedentary. We're sedentary in our yeah, everyday life. But, but perhaps we don't move that often. And we have this, as it's known as sedentary bias, we think that everyone else doesn't move as well. So let's just have a think about this. There are 7 billion people, on, more than 7 billion people on the planet. And in my way of thinking about migration, as I've just outlined to you, uh, possibly a seventh of the world's population, well over a billion people have moved during their lifetime. Uh, international migration stocks are only a small, relatively small fraction of that. The uh, stock of the world's population that have moved across an international border in their lifetime in terms of permanent residence is about 
Uh, that's round about 250 million people. What's that? About four times the population of the UK uh, are basically international migrants uh, at present. Uh, most migration is internal to countries. Uh, that takes it from 280 billion up to around about a billion. So that's more like one in seven of the world's population. Uh, this has not changed. This has been pretty stable, this 3% uh, of the world's population for about 30 or 40 years. We're a massively more globalized economy and a massively more globalized world, but yet the, uh, the rate, the propensity for international migration has stayed around about the same, around about 30, uh, sorry, 3% uh, of the world's population. Uh, the other big thing that we think about when we think about migration is forced or involuntary movement uh, associated with um, uh, war and persecution. Uh, that is round about 0.3% of the world's population. It's round about 40 to 60 million people, um, uh, depending on when you want to take, a, uh, take the average um, over the last number of decades. That number is going down, that's good to say, over the course of a couple of generations, and certainly was highest probably at the end of uh, the Second World War. Uh, but it does fluctuate very dramatically. And as a consequence, uh, and when we're talking here about refugees, we mean people moving uh, as recognized by the Geneva Convention, uh, for fleeing uh, war and persecution, and constitutes, um, yeah, it goes up and down uh, with, uh, particularly in the last decade, with the wars in Syria, uh, wars in Afghanistan, and the war in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, that is a, just a sort of picture or a set of numbers about the scale and the scope of this. So it's very common. Uh, it's happening all over the world, and it's happening mainly within countries. Uh, what's climate change got to do with this? Well, here's just a couple of... Uh, sources or a couple of projections by some authoritative sources, uh, which don't worry if you can't see, see these, I'll read them to you or I'll give you the gist of them, that climate change effects are expected to increase global tensions. Uh, again, this notion that, uh, that migration is only ever involuntary or principally, or the, that type of migration that we're worried about is involuntary migration. As nations complete for scarcer resources, threatening health and human rights and triggering conflict and mass migration. So this projection that mass migration may be a consequence of climate change in the future, along with uh, uh, interstate uh, conflicts, you know, wars between countries uh, and threatening health and human rights. And that deadly heat waves, so this is chronic heat, this is a slightly different point, uh, that hundreds of millions, possibly billions would have to move. So migration might be, uh, or this enforced movement might be in the order of billions likely resulting in severe and extended conflict. So this is lots of people having to move and that then causing conflict. Uh, this is pretty much a sort of received wisdom in the climate uh, science uh, community. Uh, these two sources are um, basically the Council of Economic Advisors report of uh, President Biden's office last year is the top one. Um, this is their annual report. So it, it's saying that uh, the US is taking climate change seriously because it might result in uh, conflict and mass migration. Uh, and uh, the discussion at the bottom is by uh, Nicholas Stern, Lord Stern, the very well-known climate change economist, along with Joe Stiglitz, his co-author, who's also a Nobel Prize winning economist or a, uh, the, Bank of, um, uh, the Bank of Sweden's uh, economics uh, prize in honor of Alfred Nobel. So two, two very eminent sources. Why are they saying this? Or what's the evidence base for this? Or you know, does this matter? They're saying it really for two reasons. Um, first of all, is it's a justification for significant climate action. It's saying we need to do something about climate change, uh, decarbonize the economy in effect, because we really need to avoid, these are potentially catastrophic things that in both the natural world and in the human world that are uh, likely to be um, uh, significantly negative consequences associated with climate change. So let's do something about it. That's President Biden's office. Uh, and then secondly, the economists are um, 
uh, concerned about this uh, because most of the economic analysis says we'll be able to cope with climate change because climate change may have consequences to the economy at the margins, but nothing very catastrophic. And therefore, you know, we need to trade off the cost of decarbonizing the economy with actually doing something uh, uh, you know, with uh, our ability to adapt. And uh, Nick Stern and Joe Stiglitz are basically saying, no, you've got it wrong. We need to do something about climate change because there are all these other consequences of climate change that are not uh, economic. Right. So what does uh, the evidence from demographers or people who've worked in this area actually say? Again, I don't need you to read these. I'm just putting up a couple of sources to, to show that this is a significant scientific um, uh, arena for cross-disciplinary research. And on the right, you see this report by the World Bank a couple of uh, five years ago now um, by a group of economists and others in the World Bank called, and the, this report called Groundswell. And they basically say that climate change is going to cause displacement of people because of um, the impact of weather-related extremes. Storms, floods, fires are going to displace people, and their best estimation was 140 million people by the end of this decade. But they said virtually all of these will be within countries, and quite a lot of these will be temporary movements, and people will go back to where they lived before. So this projection, at least over the next decades or you know, in the, uh, in the near future, is for quite a lot of displacement associated with extreme events, and a lot of that to be temporary, only temporary movement and temporary migration. And the paper on the left from colleagues at the Peace Research Institute at the University at, in Oslo, Preo, um, uh, that actually looked at asylum applications, so looked globally at where people moved um, who uh, were uh, uh, who claimed asylum, who were you know, uh, either destitute, who moved because of persecution or conflict, and was there actually any climate signal in, the, in what we've seen so far in asylum claims? And they found that there weren't, that climate, climate, con climatic conditions, extreme weather and that sort of thing basically do not explain, do not drive where people are moving from associated with um, asylum claims and sort of irregular migration. Um, they say that what does explain it is basically the incidence of uh, conflict and persecution, as you would expect. So, when the demographers and the political scientists get into this, they basically say that environmental change isn't a, isn't a principal driver of, um, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, that environmental change and climate change is not a principal driver of the sorts of migration that we're seeing at the minute that climate change does alter potentially uh, and amplify and potentially even suppress some migration flows. So there's a risk that it will happen in the future, but it's principally local and it's principally internal to countries. So can those, there's a bit of a paradox here between these two slides. Authoritative voices from the president of the United States and his, uh, and his office through to the scientists looking at this, coming up with rather contested uh, outcomes, sort of paradoxical almost. Can they both be right? Well, uh, the answer to that is, uh, this is a live and empirical research question. Uh, and what we really need to do is to go back to the basics, go back to how we understand what migration is, how it works and, uh, and actually look on the ground and see whether or not this is likely to happen. Uh, and that is what myself and many of my colleagues and uh, in the research community have been doing now for uh, around about 15 to 20 years. Some of this coalesced around a major investment by the UK government to answer this question. And this is just the front cover of a report called Migration and Global Environmental Change that comes from the Government Office of Science. The Government Office of Science is within the uh, Westminster government, and uh, it's basically the office of the chief scientific officer, uh, the, chief, you know, the chief scientist um, of, uh, chief scientific advisor of the government. Uh, by 10, 15 years ago, the chief scientist was Sir John Bennington, and he had this notion that he put across government departments and said, we've got a perfect storm coming. That perfect storm is climate change, food insecurity, 
population growth. And all these are going to come together in this perfect storm and are going to be really, really serious for the UK and for the globe. And we need to be to have foresight for the government to be looking ahead and planning for cross departmentally, not only the UK government, but all governments for this coming storm associated with uh, climate change. And part of that, John put to us, was actually the issue of uh, migration. So um, he charged a number of us, a, a, an expert group, to actually come to a definitive, to look at this in depth. And we managed to engage with the global research community, with you know colleagues all over the world. And we put together this evidence report um, on you know, the, you know, the underlying, so leaving aside these possibly alarmist statements or leaving aside a sort of look on the ground that says, I can't really see any climate change signal here. What are we likely to find? What are the principles, the demographic principles behind uh, this question? And this is what we came up with. And again, I'm not expecting you to read this, uh, but basically what we said was that you can see in the middle here, we've got decisions, this blue circle that says, Every household, every person in the world has a decision whether where to live um, and whether or not that decision is in some sense is voluntary and there's lots of agency or involuntary. It's to move or to stay. And that happens with demographic regularity. Uh, what that means is that people of a certain age tend to move. Most migration happens in your life during your life course between 18 and 35 people are more likely to move during that period than any other period in their life. So migration is a young person's activity, right? So we know that demographic regularity, but we know that it's driven uh, and that uh, these forces uh, are, you know, these underlying factors represented in this Pentagon that actually drive these, uh, the social, the political, the economic, the environmental, and the demographic dimensions the underlying drivers of how migration actually works. And the principal one of those is the economic dimension. In economic terms, uh, migration is just about the movement of labor. It's to do with spatial inequality in the, uh, in the economy. In other words, people move where they're going to get a better job, right? Um, uh, and we know that. Uh, and that economic driver, is uh, absolutely key to understanding and um, my thesis for tonight, as I talked about the economic geography of the world, the economic driver is the most important one. But climate change is going to affect all these particular drivers, the demographic drivers, the environmental dimensions to this, and the economic drivers. So climate change is going to affect the relative attractiveness of some places for, from where people move from and for people move to. And we found, whenever we reviewed evidence for this foresight report, that this was already happening and that this was happening for the major migration flows that there are in the world. The single biggest migration flow in the world, uh, just in terms of within countries, has been in China over the course of the last two generations. Probably 200 million people have moved in China from rural China to urban China in the last um, uh, 30 or 40 years. That's the single biggest movement of people we would see anywhere on the planet. And that's largely driven by the industrialization of China and that move to more to manufacturing and, and the relative unattractiveness of staying in rural China uh, and that sort of thing. But the other thing that we found, again, represented in this, uh, this two-dimensional uh, diagram, uh, is that for any... Uh, that who moves or the, the, the social distribution of who moves is captured here, that the better off you are, you don't need to, again, to understand this or to look at this in detail, but basically what this says is the better off you are, the more resources you ha have, the more networks you have, the more capital you have behind you, you're going to be more mobile. So this is this positive line. Whoops, is this going now, uh, this positive line, this uh, rising blue line, basically shows you that with increasing, uh, with high levels of well-being in terms of income, uh, natural and social capital, uh, you have an, an increased ability to move. So the better off you are, the more the easier it is for you to move, and probably the better off you are, the less you're going to be impacted by climate change. 
the inverse of that holds true, that the less well off you are, the more you're likely to be live in places that themselves are vulnerable to climate change. And whenever you take those two things together, you'll see that the people least most affected by climate change are least likely to move. And what that results in, as we've written here, is what we refer to as trapped populations. So the people, so the problem is not that there is too much migration as a result of climate change, but that there is too little mobility and too little migration as a result of climate change. And the people who really need to move don't have the resources, the uh, uh, and the um, uh, the savings, the capital, the networks, and everything else that they need to move because moving from one place to another is actually pretty costly, pretty costly in terms of your life, livelihood, your resources, your emotional ability, and your competences. So this sort of these are the principles behind it. So to get into you know some detail of what this looks like on the ground, uh, I've been involved in a significant um, research. Um, uh, effort that goes to those places that actually uh, that, that all these estimates of climate refugees actually come from. So the idea that there are going to be tens of millions or mass migration as put by President's, President Biden's office uh, comes from these ideas and these estimates of hundreds of millions of people moving because of where they're going to live is going to be uninhabitable. And the, the greatest uh, density and uh, most populous places where that are are low-lying coastal zones around the world, particularly in the world's deltas. So myself and colleagues have been engaged in uh, research in deltas um, over the past 10 years. Uh, and uh, we looked in particular deltas where if we're going to find some climate change related migration, and find some climate refugees, this is where they're going to be. And we looked in detail at three uh, deltas in Africa and Asia. Uh, these are the Volta Delta, uh, the delta in the southern part of uh, Ghana. It's all virtually within one country uh, of the Volta River. Uh, the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, which straddles India and Bangladesh. Um, and is the single largest delta in the world and probably has about 60 million people, which is the population of the UK, living in it. Um, and um, the Mahanadi Delta uh, in, East, in Odisha in eastern India, a smaller uh, delta, again, largely with the whole Mahanadi River and the Mahanadi Delta being within uh, one country. And so we've looked extensively and we've talked to lots of people with lots of our partners in Ghana, India and Bangladesh uh, uh, to look at uh, the migration flows associated with those places and whether or not there is migration associated with these places. So if we're going to find any climate change migration and climate change refugees, this is where they're going to be. So what we find is that the populations are relatively stable, but declining a little bit in all of these deltas. Uh, this is uh, just uh, two maps showing the Mahanadi Delta and the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, the part of the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta in India, across the border from Bangladesh, um, and where the people are actually moving to from those, um, uh, from those particular areas. And you'll see these arrows, and it basically shows that virtually all the migration from these places are actually within the state, but this shows the interstate uh, migration. So there's no international migration, in effect, from these, or virtually no international migration from these delta areas. People are moving out, but they're moving to other areas of India. Most of what, where they go, uh, in both of these cases, Ganges, Brahmaputra, and in the Mahanadi, is to Kolkata, the large city of Kolkata on the east coast. So the movements are predominantly internal. Uh, there's various forms of mobility. Uh, some of it permanent, but quite a lot of it circular and quite a lot of it seasonal. So people move out of these deltas, move to the city, earn a bit of money, remit some of that money, I send that money back, and also move back to the deltas uh, either during their lifetime or even on a yearly basis. And there's a limited, but certainly an identifiable environmental or climate signal within what's going on here. 
So we do see that climate change is affecting uh, migration patterns in these deltas. But at present, what we're seeing is business as usual, which is the movement of people from these rural areas to urban areas because of the same as happened in China, the relative attractiveness of moving to the city in terms of your life, livelihood, economic opportunities and educational opportunities for your children. Uh, this is just the same result for, the, for Bangladesh, um, just drawn in a slightly different way in a circular plot, which shows at the bottom the delta uh, and the destination uh, for the uh, migration from that. And we can see that the migration from the delta of Bangladesh, which everyone you know, considers or thinks about as being the ground zero of climate change in terms of sea level change and the loss of the Sundarban National Park and the rest of it, um, that basically people are moving to three large cities, to Dhaka, to Kulna, and to uh, Chittagong, which is the second large city, also now known as Chattagram. And so you can see exactly the same, again, from our sample surveys of uh, that there is virtually, there's a little bit of international, bit more international migration from Bangladesh, but hardly any, and basically people are moving to the cities. So, there are a billion migrants in the world, um, and we can look at, uh, just looking at these sorts of places, uh, we look at, you know, so I'm just giving you the terminology here, the source or the origin, the places where people move from, and the destination, places where people move to. Uh, and we can see that um, uh, that the in terms of sources, is the changing life, you know, the changing food security, the changing ability to farm, the increasing salinization of water courses in low-lying deltas that's affecting the people's prospects for the future. Um, uh, and these economic and educational, which is uh, basically for the next generation, you know, draw to move to the cities, the destination cities uh, where there is these, you know, potential for increased material well-being. And we can see the motivations and we can actually then directly ask people about uh, those, uh, their motivations for moving and whether or not they uh, have succeeded. But we also want to look at aspirations for the future and whether or not these environmental changes, uh, degradation of the environment, uh, economic insecurity are also driving their aspirations of people who are living in source areas, whether or not they're likely to, their propensity to, their likelihood that they're going to move in future, if that's going to be amplified by the prospect of climate change. So these two questions uh, we report on, yeah, you know, I've just given you some sources here and some papers, and I've just put this up because the title explains exactly what we found that perceived environmental risks and insecurity in sourced areas. So in these deltas, we asked lots of farmers and farming communities whether or not they were, whether or not they perceived there were environmental risks and whether or not that was going to accelerate or reduce their likelihood of migrating in the future. And we find that it actually reduces future migration intentions in these hazardous migration source areas. So in other words, putting that simply, the impact of environmental change and environmental risk means that people are less likely to move, not more likely to move. And the reason for that is known as the resource constraint hypothesis, or put simply, is the fact that it's quite costly to move. And if you have bad years, you don't have the savings either to send one of your sons or daughters to the city, uh, or to actually pack up and leave the whole, you know, leave entirely. So this is an observation of what we refer to as trapped populations. And just one other uh, result from this study, uh, this is where we asked people uh, in uh, those source areas, in those deltas, what, were the, what was the principal motivation for people in your household leaving? These were all households where uh, in the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, so this is just the Bangladesh, uh, 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 subsample here are the people that we spoke to in Bangladesh, then basically all of them said it's economic reasons they left. A few of them said that there were social reasons, you know, education for their kids and the rest of it. Uh, and you'll see this third column here is basically environmental uh, reasons. So basically hardly anyone, hardly anyone, and this is the same in Bangladesh, the same in India, and the same in Ghana, 
said that migration had happened because of environmental reasons. So we went looking for climate migration and climate migrants. And if you ask people, so in terms of self-reported motivations for moving, no one said, virtually no one said it was environmental or climate reasons. So we went looking for climate migrants. We didn't find them. But people did tell us that they were uh, extraordinarily exposed to uh, climate risks like cyclones, floods, salinity, which is increasing salinization, increasing soil levels, so, uh, salt levels in the soil, which makes it much more difficult to grow uh, crops, particularly rice, uh, drought, storm surges, and erosion. So the, you know, their perceptions of exposure to environmental risk were high, uh, virtually everyone, and their perceptions of how that changed were all, was also going up. So people felt more insecure in these places. But whenever we correlated this and looked at it in detail, this meant that their aspirations to move were probably, or their expectations that were going to move were actually diminished. So this was an, these are all examples of places where people are less likely to move rather than more likely to move. What happens whenever they do move, right? So this is the other part of the migration story. So we've looked at source, now we're looking at destination. So in Bangladesh, people moved to three cities, as I said, uh, Kulna, Dhaka, and Chittagong, which is the second largest city, the port city, also now known as Chattagram. I'll refer to it as Chattagram. <clears throat> uh, basically, where do people move uh, from? They moved from, uh, on the graph on the left, they moved from uh, basically the immediate divisions, the immediate regions of Bangladesh, from southern Bangladesh, the Delta region, into the city. When Bangladesh became independent in 1971, uh, Chattagram was about a million and a half people. It's now five and a half million people. And it's not because people are having lots of children there. I, it's not natural population growth. It's basically all driven by migration. So four, you know, getting on for four million people has moved into the city from the surrounding areas. So this city has grown topsy-turvy uh, in the course of a lifetime, mainly because of the growth of jobs. And most of those jobs are in things like the garment industry. And if we actually all scot out the labels of the clothes that we're wearing tonight, we'd find at least a proportion of all the clothes that are being worn in this room were made in Chattagram. If it says made in Bangladesh, it was probably made in Chittagong in hundreds of garment factories, thousands of garment factories. The migration to, to, to Chittagong is also uh, really quite unusual because it tends to be women rather than men. I'll go, not go into the detail of that, but let's look at the life and livelihoods of uh, people living there. Uh, so if we're going to have, if this is going to be the trend, and this is where climate change is really going to bite, if this is going to be the crucible of it in growing cities because of migration into cities for reasons of economic, uh, you know, economic uh, and other reasons, then this is where we're going to find trapped populations, and this is where we're going to have to deal with the consequences of climate change. And therefore, this is where adaptation is going to have to happen. And again, in our studies with our Bangladeshi colleagues, we actually began to, to look at this problem. And we said that then the, our thesis or hypothesis in this research is that to make safe and sustainable and resilient cities, uh, what we need is to be able to integrate or to deal with the fact that people are moving there, that this growth, these rapidly growing cities are basically going to have to integrate their new populations into planning for the cities and make them actually more sustainable and safe in the context of climate change going forward. And the reason for that is really captured within the sustainable development goals that you might have heard of. So every country in the world from the, in the United Nations has signed up to these sustainable development goals. And there is a sustainable development goal about cities. It's called SDG 11 of the 17. They're all numbered 1 to 17. And SDG 11 is about sustainable cities and communities. And it has a number of goals uh, that by 2030 to ensure safe and affordable housing and to uh, increase the capacity for 
uh, sustainable settlement planning to protect the poor and vulnerable uh, and poor people in vulnerable situations to increase air quality and environmental things like waste management, to give access um, to green spaces um, and to link rural to, uh, to their hinterlands. So this is what we mean and our targets and goals associated with um, making these sorts of places rapidly growing cities from Glasgow to Chittagong safe, resilient and, and uh, sustainable. Can we do that in places like uh, Chittagong? What we did uh, in this particular um, instance as social scientists was to do something that we refer to as action research. <clears throat> action research is slightly different to experimental research, and it's slightly different to what we might just refer to as ordinary research or obser observational research. But action research means actually trying to uh, create some social change and then studying that social change from the inside out as it's going on. It's quite difficult to do, uh, has all sorts of ethical uh, dilemmas associated with doing action research, but I'll just explain what that means in this context. So we did some action research, and, and what we did was we tried to integrate some migrants into the city planning process. We tried to give them voice and we tried to increase their, you know, to try to bring about this thesis, which is we need to integrate migrants into city planning or they won't be sustainable. So we tried to make that happen by giving them voice and increasing the empathy of city planners towards the migrants who had been moved to there. This is just a flow diagram of the different processes we went to. And part of this was done using what are known as visual methods, um, uh, 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 visual methods within the social sciences. Uh, and this is a technique known as photo voice. So what we did was we recruited quite a lot of the city planners within Chittagong, the people who are making the decisions to build the infrastructure that now allows for five and a half million people. Um, and we gave each of them cameras or their mobile phones. And we say, go out and tell us take photographs of what you mean by a safe, sustainable and resilient city. And then we recruited the same number of new migrants to the city, people who had moved to work in the garment industry or people who were just living in the, inf or who were working in the informal sector in slums in Chittagong. And if they didn't have a smartphone, we gave them a camera or we give them a phone. We say, go out and take photographs and tell us what a safe, sustainable and resilient city means to you. Some people took 100 photographs in over a couple of weeks. Some people took 1,000. And what we did was we sat down with each of those you know, uh, individuals and we went through to them and said, pick, give us, give us what, what, this, you know, what this means to you or pick us your favorite photographs or your most meaningful photographs of the issues that you think really constitutes safety and sustainability here in the city. Um, and you would imagine that the planners would actually have rather different photographs from, uh, from, the, uh, from migrants, new migrants into the city. And there's a, certainly a big asymmetry, a big difference in the sort of power here. Some people are making decisions, some people are the people who are recipients of these decisions. But actually using these methods, everyone had their three photographs that they chosen were most important. We brought them together and we said, okay, let's share these and let's actually have a common dialogue about and Put each put sit in each other's shoes and you know and build some empathy between different communities about what constitutes safety and sustainability. And this has been incredibly successful and you know um, uh, very well uh, received by all the city planners. And they say we don't have this sort of information that comes from the migrant communities about what's going on. The other the great thing about visual methods is uh, is the, actually the narratives around them, what the, these recipients told us about the photographs. And the great thing about a camera is it points out and it basically gives you a narration and being able to explain, you know, it takes a photograph of the world around you. That's what we expected. That's not what we got. What we got actually was a lot of selfies. <laughs> So the technology has changed. So the camera is no longer outward facing. It's now putting yourself at the center of this. And this is one of our recipients. Uh, he's, uh, we just referred to him as CP7. He's a city planner in Chittagong. 
I'll not tell you his name, we've anonymized him. And he took this fantastic photograph and you can see uh, that he's basically sitting on the back of a rickshaw going to work and he's going down the middle of a street and it's flat. Out. And you know, so there are all these environmental issues going on in Chittagong, yeah? Um, and he's talking about waterlogging being a regular phenomenon. He didn't take a photograph of the rickshaw driver, the guy that was pulling him along. He took a photograph of himself at the center of this and this was his um, whatever. Um, but he was fantastic just in terms of recognizing what these things were. Uh, this is also, he also handed the phone to someone else who took another photograph of him, so the same person. Uh, and this is him, and uh, this is down on the waterfront in uh, Chittagong and sort of recognizing the benefits of place and, you know, how people are proud of Chittagong when they're there and they like to congregate in the importance of green and open space for their life and livelihood. Uh, some of the photographs, you think, oh, that was just a mistake. Someone's, the, foot, the camera was pointing to the ground and it doesn't really, you know, what is that? That was a mistake. But this was a very meaningful photograph taken by M3, one of our migrants. And it's basically sandbags out the back of their house. So what that is on the left is, you can see this is the back entrance of their house and the corrugated tin there. And, uh, and this was the story they told us about their landlord and about the um, uh, insecurity they felt. And the, you know, despite the flooding in their neighborhood, the landlord wasn't doing anything about it and, said, and basically said, if you don't like it, leave. Uh, and so housing tenure, um, and these sort of things are major problems. And this is not something that you would anticipate that, you know, this is not, these photographs are not taken for their aesthetics or for, you know, they're not going to win any competitions, photography competitions, but they're incredibly meaningful because they actually highlight what constitutes safety and sustainability for these places. Ah, what's that? It's a photograph of some kid's foot. And um, well, that's actually a plaster on, you know, uh, one of the, uh, sorry, I don't have the um, respondent's number there. Uh, this was one of the uh, women who took this and it was actually one of their kids and who'd been bathing in the river and actually got cut by glass um, and had to wrap up and they were really worried about infections because of water quality. And so these were the sorts of issues that people raised and sort of photographs that they took. Um, I, again, just to show us uh, so what some of these issues were and what these uh, risks of, of living in the city are coming from the migrants' perspectives were actually about waterlogging in these low-lying slum areas. Uh, landslides in hilly areas, the risk of eviction from uh, Ill in illegal settlements, and so insecurity and tenure insecurity, and in, uh, inadequate uh, access to services uh, like education, discrimination in, uh, in job markets, um, and not accessibility of uh, water, not accessibility of uh, toilets, uh, and various other things. Uh, so this method actually brings all these uh, brings these uh, issues to the fore. And you know, and lots of other issues. Uh, so this photograph, um, again, is very meaningful. And the person taking it is uh, the the respondent is the guy in the blue uh, shirt there on the uh, on the right. And this was really meaningful to him, and um, because he was from an ethnic minority in Chittagong, who are, um, from the Chittagong Hill Track uh, ethnic minority, which are from the hills in eastern Bangladesh, and many of them uh, now live in Bangladesh in Chittagong City. Uh, and the person uh, on the third on the left there uh, with the white shirt is the mayor of Chittagong. And this was showing solidarity from the mayor uh, coming to the opening of this new community center for the, um, in this case, the Buddhist ethnic minority in Chittagong. Uh, this happened at a time when the Rohingya refugees were coming across the border in Chittagong, just down the road. Uh, and are now in a large refugee camp. Uh, and what this um, uh, showed, what, and so uh, the, in the majority Muslim uh, Bangladesh, uh, it was you know, this uh, idea that this was uh, the Buddhist um, uh, majority in Myanmar that were oppressing the Rohingya refugees and people in uh, Buddhist minorities in Chittagong were very worried that they were gonna get the blame for this and the rest of it. And so the solidarity uh, with the uh, with the mayor of Chittagong coming along and saying, no, you're part of the community and the rest of it. Uh, so all of these different aspects uh, about what constitutes migrant well-being in the city, their perception of their integration in the city, and all these environmental risks and challenges, you know, we can actually begin to map from all this data coming using these uh, um, uh, visual methods and also from all these interview methods and some survey work that we did. And it basically shows 
the dimensions that it's beyond material well-being and education, uh, that it is uh, ideas of dignity, it's social well-being and integration, and it's health that really uh, are consequential for migrant populations and constitute safe and sustainable cities in this case. And the city planners were blown away by this because they did not have this sort of information that, that and were not building this into what they were doing in terms of the master plan for the city. Um, I think I'll skip over some of these, but just to say that uh, we, and also in the survey data, what we also show is that, live it, that this uh, city living, particularly in low income neighborhoods, is actually really stressful and that we find high levels of anxiety and depression uh, measured for the first time. This is unpublished data as yet, um, but high levels of anxiety, high levels of stress and low levels of um, uh, life satisfaction. So although life might become materially better in moving to the city, it actually isn't for everyone. And actually you find um, that uh, these environmental risks and these uh, issues of discrimination mean that people do not have happy lives. But what we, from this, and again, I don't expect you to read this, actually managed to uh, promote within this is the set of principles and a set of ideas and some very specific ideas about places, about where entrepreneurs should be, be able to set up markets, about reform of the uh, tenure system uh, and you know, what landlords were allowed to do uh, within the city plan of uh, Chittagong. Chittagong in terms of where migrants live, where they work, and what the city is expected to do for them. So this action research did bring about some action and actually helped possibly moved us towards a more safe and sustainable city in the sorts of places where people are moving to, where the climate risks are equally as large in the places they're moving to as they are in the places they're moving from. This actually is uh, promoted globally, or these ideas are now being looked at in cities across the world. There is a progressive set of mayors called the Mayors Migration Council, or sort of spin off of another set of progressive mayors in the group of what are known as the C40 group of mayors. Uh, C40 is, you know, uh, mayors of, uh, this is climate 40, so 40 mayors of big metropolitan cities all around the world have come together to act on climate, and a subgroup of them, including the mayor of Dhaka, uh, North Dhaka in uh, Bangladesh, including the mayor of Bristol in the UK, have put out this set of principles um, on what cities should be doing in terms of climate change and migration. And it's 10 principles, and these were launched here in Glasgow two years ago at the conference of the 26th Conference of the Parties of the Climate Change Convention. The city mayors came here, and this is what they said. And again, I'm not expecting you to read this, but they have 10 principles for what cities could and should be doing for um, uh, to deal with this issue of climate change. And those basically include making cities more, uh, more open to migrants coming in, particularly migrants fleeing uh, the consequences of climate change, but also making cities themselves more safe and sustainable from flood risk, walking up you know, Buchanan Street this afternoon to all the way through to um, yeah, uh, decarbonizing and making uh, making cities themselves, you know, progressive in terms of dealing with the climate issue. Five minutes, thanks. Uh, we have taken this challenge, um, and again, with a, a group of economists, myself, uh, and a number of environmental scientists, ecologists, and uh, and economists, and we've sort of mapped out what these challenges. Uh, might be, uh, and we basically have argued that it really depends on how climate change is going to unfold and what the relative shape of these different challenges is going to be. If we are going forward in a sort of low, in a world that isn't any more mobile than we have at the minute, uh, and where international migration rates are going to stay together, you know, stay at the same level at 3%, you know, 3% uh, of the world population, and so no major demographic change, you know, a stabilization of the population globally, uh, then it really depends. So this is what we've referred to in the lower part of this is low mobility or no changing mobility. Then it really depends on whether or not we're moving from a low impact climate world or a high impact climate world. 
So if we have sustained growth and climate change turns out not to be so uh, significant, we still need to do adaptation in cities that I've just talked about in Chittagong. We still need to make cities safe and sustainable. We're going to have to redouble our efforts if we're actually cities are going to be, if we're as we move to having from about 55% of all the world's population living in cities, as we have at the minute, to possibly stabilizing around about 75 or 80% of the world's population living in cities. So as we move from seven to nine billion people and a stabilization at that level, uh, we're going to have a lot more people living in cities, and we're going to have to make cities much more resilient uh, to the impacts of climate change, because a lot of people are going to move there. But in a slightly more worst case world, we're going to be faced with equal dilemmas. In a high climate change impact world, but with low mobility on the top left, you can see the key issue is the idea, this issue of trapped populations, that people are going to be trapped in rural areas, as we're already beginning to see, and they're going to be trapped socially immobile and physically immobile in cities. And therefore, you know, this is going to be a huge issue in terms of humanitarian assistance associated with extreme weather events. Uh, we're going to have to get, you know, be much more proactive in terms of disaster uh, preparedness and in actually in planning for relocation of people from places where they're no longer likely to be. There is international movement on this. Well, I've talked about the Mayor's Migration Council. I talked about adaptation. There are adaptation funds within the Framework Convention on Climate Change. But one of the big other impetus in this area is this idea, which also came to the forefront in COP26 in Glasgow and was formalized here around the idea of loss and damage. Loss and damage from climate change is basically an articulation as articulated in the Paris Agreement of the Climate Change Convention that the impacts of climate change that we can't adapt to, these losses and damaging damages that we're experiencing from climate change in the present day and increasing in the future should be compensated for those most vulnerable countries. And this has been pushed very hard by the Climate Vulnerable Forum, I, the 50 countries in the world, the 50 out of the 200 countries in the world that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And many of these, led by Bangladesh, are the um, uh, are least developed uh, countries. Uh, this is just a fantastic uh, image. It was public art. It sort of lit up the streets of Glasgow two years ago, whenever I was here. Um, it was a public art installation. If you saw it, it was actually just outside the uh, COP um, uh, negotiations down on the river, uh, down at the conference center. And also this issue really lit up the whole of uh, the COP26 as well. Um, one of the, the ways that, that loss and damage is spoken about is actually economic losses and damages, but also non-economic loss and damage. So other things that we really care about. And within the Framework Convention on Climate Change, there are nine of those. Um, and they include cultural heritage, indigenous knowledge, and uh, loss of artifacts, physical artifacts, and um, the loss of cultural integrity and uh, place to live, citizenship, the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services, uh, and the loss of health. So these are all losses and damages that we should be compensating those parts of the world. But also one of these is mobility. So how do we deal with this? How do we say, should we be compensating people or facilitate, facilitating people to move as a result of climate change? Since COP26 here in Glasgow, uh, this has been now formalized at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. And we have a, a committee that's actually moving to generate a very significant global fund on loss and damage, how would we allocate funds towards issues like mobility and migration under loss and damage? That's actually one of the key uh, uh, dilemmas and challenges that we're actually moving towards in this. Scotland actually has a, had a significant part to play in this. You'll notice the first minister of Scotland two years ago uh, was actually the first government uh, anywhere in the world to actually pledge money to this loss and damage fund. It was two million pounds, followed by another five million pounds. It probably needs a hundred billion dollars. So it's a drop in the ocean. Um, but it was, the, it was a recognition that this is a climate justice issue by the first minister two years ago. And this is just a sort of tweet by Nicola Sturgeon in her great meeting with uh, an advocate, a fantastic advocate of 
uh, climate change and loss and damage, a Bangladeshi scientist called Salim al Hook, sitting on the left there, who had these lovely interactions with Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, Salim al Hook uh, died last Saturday, um, age 71. You may have seen in the newspapers eulogies towards him. He's a great, great um, advocate and a very old friend of mine and a great advocate for climate justice. Um, so I'm dedicating this lecture uh, tonight to his memory. My conclusions then. Uh, I hope I've shown you, or I hope I've made these points that climate change is going to alter the economic geography of the world, where people live, how they live, and how they're going to live their lives and make a life and livelihood. Climate-related uh, migration is happening now. It's not the principal move, reason why it's happening now, um, but uh, these flows could increase and climate change is likely to be more important in the future. Cities need to be uh, are the place where the crucible of this is actually going to come together and need to be made safe, resilient, and sustainable. And we do need this international cooperation on migration flows, on an adaptation. And as ever with a climate change talk, I'll have to say, this is a matter of climate justice and injustice. And what we really need to do is to avoid climate change in the first place by decarbonizing our economies. Uh, thank you. This is the work of myself, but many other collaborators and colleagues and funders around the world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Neil. That was an absolutely fascinating lecture, which covered huge ground. And I know that there are going to be many questions in your mind. So the first thing I'll do is invite our roving microphonist, if that's a word, to come and uh, pick up the microphone. There is only one this week. Apologies for that. So uh, whoever has the microphone will have to work particularly hard. This is it. Now, while we're doing that, please uh, begin to formulate your questions. And uh, as there are likely to be many, I'll ask you, please, to keep your question concise and direct so that we can fit as many in as we possibly can in the time that remains. So thank you. Let's begin. Who would like to ask the first question? Did anyone hear this? Yeah. No. <laughs> One at the front. We're just a few difficulties with the microphone. Lady over there by the uh, glass wall on the left. If you like to raise your hand as we go, I'll just anticipate where we go next with the microphone. Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I was interested in your slides that you said were not published yet. Sorry, the I was interested in your slides that you said were not published yet to do with well-being. Yes. And to ask you, were these taken in a static way or are you looking at doing these over time to look at what happens when people come into a city yeah. and how they um, ha their lifespan within that city and, and their migration route there in terms of their well-being? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so I'll just I'll try and repeat it or if I get the or repeat the question see if I've got it right uh, which is these slides that I showed which is that uh, this result that uh, of diminished well-being of people who've moved to the city or an increase in uh, decrease in some uh, markers or indicators of well-being particularly mental health well um, uh, those were uh, actually one off um, uh, those are a cross section so we don't have that over time but in another study um, what we've done um, both in Chittagong and another, and in other, the other three cities in Bangladesh, the other two cities where people moved to, is actually to look at those in terms of recent migrants and longer term migrants who've moved for a longer time. And what we see is, and I tried to sort of articulate this, is that, that migration is still remains a really, really popular strategy because actually it works. People tend to have an increasing you know, there is some increasing social mobility and increasing income, and that's why people move. They move for themselves and they move for their children um, and their children's you know, economic future. So you do see an increase in material well-being, but we see these measures, at least in this cross-section, of how people feel about themselves, subjective well-being, actually being very static. 
This is sometimes known as the miserable migrant thesis. Um, uh, and it isn't that these people are miserable, it is that their lives, you know, that their life satisfaction doesn't increase with the same level as their um, uh, material well being. Um, uh, because uh, life is hard. And some of this is also to do with aspiration. So one of the things about moving to these particular cities is you get trapped in, uh, let's call them slum areas, uh, where actually social mobility, the ability to move out of these is actually very, very difficult. And that makes life very hard. I hope that answers your question. So it's not time series data, but we have some cross-sectional uh, anal analogies to that. Thanks. Lady in light green in the row behind, and then the lady in dark green further up. Um, your slide on the action research and the dignity section, you commented that many of the migrants in Chittagong or Chattagram are actually women garment workers. There's thousands and thousands of them. Yeah. How many of your action research were women? Because what I found interesting, what was missing was no reference to what is known as Eve teasing. Sorry, as a ref Eve teasing. So in other words, uh, discrimination against women, yes. which is characterized by women in Bangladesh as Eve teasing, Eve as in Adam and Eve. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so this is, um, uh, again, one of the dilemmas of doing this sort of research, which is in any cultural context, you know, um, there are, you know, uh, there, there, there is asymmetry. There is asymmetry of economic opportunity, or you know, sort of differences in economic opportunity and differences in the way that men and women are treated to each other. Um, uh, this is very difficult research to do. We have all these planners, most of whom were men, um, and you know, they're all professionals and they sit in offices and you know, uh, they have, you know, and they've all got degrees and master's degrees, and they're doing, and most of them are engineers and they're doing all this planning, and they don't actually come in contact with women workers in the factories and you know, people who live in slums or work in, the, um, in these sorts of areas. Um, uh, some of the photographs and some of the issues that people raised are, is about women's safety and is about um, uh, you know, security, you know, uh, sexual harassment and other uh, you know, um, things that pertain particularly to women and uh, also, you know, sort of uh, particularly in terms of shared toilets and the risk of, you know, sexual harassment and all sorts of things. Bringing these to the table is actually very difficult. Um, uh, and uh, I will only advocate for the benefit of the, of the power of these visual images. And that the one thing that we managed to do was to put everyone on a level playing field by saying, well, I've, here are my perspectives on what constitutes you know, the things that I'm worried about, because I've got my three photographs, and we actually put them all out on tables, and, you know, we printed them and actually put them out. And so you, my photograph was equally valid to your photograph, even though you were a city planner and a, you know, engineer, and, you know, you were in charge of a big budget and built a lot of roads and buildings and that sort of thing, compared to women workers in, um, uh, in local factories. Some of the uh, women that we worked with who were respondents in this actually came all the way to, um, to Dhaka, took a, long, took a couple of days off work, uh, which was a big you know, hit on their income and came all the way by bus to Dhaka so that we actually with some big, you know, sort of national politicians, they sort of gave testimony to some of these national politicians in Dhaka about their life and livelihood and the rest of it. I hope it was empowering for them. For them. I, that was the purpose of doing the research. And we can only do what we can do in uh, in the cultural context. Thanks. Lady in dark green, halfway up on the left, and then the gentleman just uh, two rows in front. Hey, thanks. Um, I had, oh, sorry. Uh, I had um, a sort of methodological question for you. Um, when you were uh, talking about how um, people self-reported their reasons for migration. Uh, you had most of them saying, oh, well, I've, I've migrated for economic reasons. But then in the environmental reasons category, you had listed several things that seemed like they would have pretty strong economic impacts. And I wondered how yeah. you would separate that out, both in terms of the self-reported surveys and also in broader senses, like looking at trends across populations. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, thank you for that uh, question, just in terms of methods, survey methods, and how, what we uh, ask people and how they report it, and this sort of self-reporting of uh, environment not being particular. So uh, those that first slide, which basically shows that people say, well, of course I move for economic reasons, is uh, basically reflects what you would see in any survey of migrants anywhere in the world, um, that basically people move because they want to make a better life for themselves and or a better life for their families and or the next generation, access a better access to schools, better access to education, that sort of thing. Um, we weren't surprised, but it was sort of confirmatory where hardly anyone said, oh, well, you know, my house fell into the sea or, you know, I was completely flooded or whatever, um, because the just the flows of people, you know, that is um, um, what they were doing. It is much more complicated whenever we then get into perceptions of whether or not the environment is changing. And basically what people told us, trying to take the broader sense here, is that their life in the, the life of people living in rural areas, in rural areas in uh, India, or, you know, uh, really these are some of the breadbaskets of these countries. They're highly productive, you know, uh, really dense agricultural areas where every, you know, every field is, you know, got rice growing in it twice a year. And, you know, and there's quite a lot of shrimp ponds and all these sort of things that they actually felt more insecure about it. So there were quite a lot of um, uh, uh, people thought that their food security, their ability to grow enough food and or sell enough food to, you know, um, and other products to actually make a life and livelihood was under threat. They also thought things were getting worse over time. So in some senses, people weren't self-reporting that they were moving for economic reasons, but they could see their, their, economic, their economic situation was getting worse because the environment was getting more unstable or there were just more extremes, you know, and the, the likelihood of losing their agricultural livelihood was actually going down. Uh, so sorry, that was, so I only showed this summary statistics and didn't go into, you know, in these graphs and didn't go into the details of that, but I'm happy to talk to you about it afterwards or send you the papers and we can, have a dialogue. Thanks. Gentleman on the aisle. Yeah, hi there, evening. Um, I remember seeing a film uh, a long time ago by Al Gore. I forget which year it was now, 2005, I'm not sure. You might remember it. So there's two questions, really. Did you watch that film, The An Inconvenient Truth? And did, did he not show in that film all the research as to where uh, carbon uh, CO2 increase and uh, research from the 1950s and the scientists who were doing it and also the impacts of the climate change problem that people were not taking on board at that time. Uh, this conflict that we're getting now in Gaza and Israel, the political conflicts, the, uh, uh, the triggers in the world and also this uh, population migration and uh, explosion. It's all there in, in Al Gore's film. Uh, the government's never heeded it, and uh, we're living in uh, a post Al Gore situation, aren't we? Uh, <clears throat> I went to see uh, Al Gore giving the lecture tour um, uh, associated with that film and book. Um, the book was called An Inconvenient Truth. It was back in 2005. Um, I saw him in uh, Cambridge, uh, Cambridge in England, uh, that is. Um, and it was a room full about you know, this number of people, it was in the sort of, in the city, it's not at the university. Um, and I have to say every, he was absolutely mesmerizing. He was absolutely fantastic. I'd never heard someone hold a, an audience together for two hours straight without a break. He was amazing. But I have to say every single person, I'm sitting next to um, uh, the Catholic Bishop of East Anglia actually, and we both said the same thing. And um, there's a slightly random story. We were all thinking the same thing, which was, my goodness, this could have been the president of the United States. <laughs> uh, he lost the 2000 presidential election because of the hanging chance. That was my thought at the time. Uh, and uh, some of us were introduced to him afterwards and because um, we were working in the area and that sort of thing. And uh, he, he was absolutely adamant. He didn't want to talk about adaptation to climate change. He said, that dilutes the story. We really, really, really need to show that the impacts of climate change are real, they're consequential, and we really need to decarbonize the economy as quickly as possible. And I couldn't agree with you more that we've basically wasted 20 years since Al Gore was saying it. And that 20 years is really going to come back to bite us, both in terms of the impacts of climate change, 
and actually the speed at which we're going to have to decarbonize the economy. So I couldn't agree more with your statement. Lady, lady in the front row, and then gentlemen for uh, rows back. Do we have any online questions here? No? Okay. Lady, lady first. She's further up the queue. <laughs> hey, actually, a gentleman. Uh, oh, I think it's fun. <laughs> uh, no, that's all right. Uh, thank glasses. you very much for the talk. I'm sad it could be longer. Uh, I actually moved up to Glasgow recently at the beginning of this year for sort of cl oh, for there we go for climate climate reasons. I I've just been thinking like when climate change bites, uh, you want to be somewhere damp with lots of water, and I'm really. I'm really terrified about the future. I don't actually believe that I have a meaningful and happy kind of life ahead of me. Uh, and the question I have, it doesn't necessarily reach, relate to your field, but you're probably well placed to answer it. But do you think we can reach net zero and fully yeah. decarbonize our economy in our current economic and political model, which has a sort of insatiable desire to grow the economy and thus create more opportunities for other people? What a fantastic question. Thank you uh, so much uh, for that, which was um, this person at the front. Uh, I would say brings down the average age um, slightly. So I'm not making any yeah, aspersions, uh, but you know, the, the current generations are thinking, actually, the future is not looking rosy. And you know, am I optimistic as to whether or not we can solve this problem? Um, if that summarizes your question. Uh, uh, let me deal with that in two, um, two, uh, parts to, two parts in answer. First of all, I am optimistic. I think we can absolutely decarbonize the economy. I think we've wasted 20 years or more since you know, uh, climate science has um, you know, pointed these things out. Also, nearly 20 years ago, Lord Stern, Nick Stern, made the economic case for why we should be decarbonizing the economy. Uh, both of those have, as you say, sort of fallen on deaf ears. In the interim, there are two positive, re positive reasons to look at, one of which is the economy has moved ahead without us, and the ability to decarbonize the electricity system has accelerated like there's no tomorrow, and the benefits of renewable energy and decarbonizing the electricity system are indisputable, and it's happening everywhere and it's likely to happen at speed and scale that we haven't seen uh, before. And secondly, so although the climate science and the economics haven't made the case, I think we're beginning to realize that climate change affects other aspects of life and things that we really care about, health, well-being, um, or communities and the rest of it. And I think that does lead uh, to a change, and therefore I am absolutely optimistic that we can I'll not say solve the problem, but actually lead to a meaningful future. And I also think, based on progressive cities, on an, you know, um, uh, youth movements, youth activism, all sorts of reasons that we are going to move away from a climate change, uh, fossil fuel-based economy, we're going to move away from a climate change catastrophe and uh, whatever. But a second part of my answer also is around this uh, and if I can paraphrase it and say an eco-anxiety uh, that we have, that actually um, that climate change you know, comes to us or challenges our whole sense, in some ways, our whole sense of identity. Um, Amit of Gosh refers to this as the great derangement that we actually haven't quite realized that the world is not what, it's not just stable, it's not just um, predictable, it's not you know that you know that we don't have um any agency i think what we can begin to see is that we do have agency to change we do need to change democratic systems to deal with long term problems that we don't have uh, solutions to and what we really don't want to do although i'm really tempted to do it is to say and it's up to the next generation <laughs> to solve these uh, problems but i think these problems are all absolutely solvable and they're all absolutely solvable by not by saying it's all about political will but actually about the application of knowledge and the application of you know sort of uh, ideas and the gener and it's basically a failure of our imagination not to solve these problems rather than anything else and that's why i'm optimistic
Since we're on the front row, we'll take the gentleman here, then the gentleman four rows back, and then one on this side. Thanks. Um, I was interested that you're, talk you're talking about move to the cities, but what, shouldn't we be looking at reducing rural depopulation, which is a theme in Europe? Yeah. I mean, I don't yeah. know anything about Bangladesh or India, and the, but that's certainly a major theme in Europe, and it's linked to housing problems. Yeah very strongly linked to housing problems in Scotland. Yeah. You also commented on housing problems in the cities. Yeah, yeah. Mentioning. I mean, I think it's probably useful to link housing insecurity with a need to tackle um, climate change issues. Just, just that's one point. Yeah. The other point about change is that I do think that we need to continually think of new ways of keeping climate at the top of the agenda, yes. because it very easily slides down. One wee example of that, as I was talking to somebody from Sweden, who said Sweden, very progressive, trying to keep people in the islands, um, yeah. in, uh, stop the expense caused by moving to cities. Look, um, so they built new roads to the islands, which the idea was, and bridges, the idea was to make them more usable. But what happens is that results in increased depopulation. What he was saying is they should have spent the money they spent on the roads and bridges on enterprises and housing in the islands but rather than increasing transportation uh, uh, thank you uh, so much so i those are sort of related uh, points uh, i'll answer that in two ways um uh, the first uh, one of which is you know i absolutely agree and although i've talked about people moving and i've talked a lot about cities uh, dealing with uh, the consequences of climate change really uh, is a, a lightning rod or is a, a, a basically a way to talk about sustainable futures and you know dealing with all of these things in an integrated way. It's also about where we grow our food, how we grow our food, who's going to do that. And as you say, the future of rural areas is just as important as what's going to happen uh, within cities. And also going back to actually Sir John Beddington had a you know, uh, at a time of stability, it was, well, it was just after the financial crash, you know, had this vision that actually across government, we need to be dealing with issues or the way that governments deal with this, need to be dealing the, with these in a holistic way. And, you know, to see uh, climate change as a cross, uh, as a challenge um, to the future across issues that range from housing policy, uh, regional you know, a sort of, you know, regional policy, let's call it, and, you know, um, uh, and not just to see this as something that's only to do with the energy system or only to do with transport or, or that sort of thing. In the Bangladesh case, Bangladesh, and actually my colleague, Salim al Hook, who passed away this week, was a big advocate for regional redistribution of population within Bangladesh. So having smaller cities and not everyone moving to these big agglomerated cities that are, you know, Dhaka is now getting on for 20 million people. Um, uh, and, you know, so this idea that we're inevitably moving towards an urbanized world, um, we do need to, in the context of climate change and many other, you know, for many other sustainability challenges, to look at this relationship, relationship between town and country. Um, another element to this, I have to say, is, uh, is mobility as choice uh, and that people will choose to move and that's, you know, doing these things where you can predict, you know, building roads to say, oh, well, that'll, you know, allow people to move back and forward, but actually it facilitates, facilitates depopulation. We have to get inside the mind or understand the, the social context in which um, migration and people's choice of where, where to move and the rest of it uh, matters. But you're absolutely right. We need to look at sustainability of everywhere, including rural areas. Thanks. Four rows back, gentlemen there at the uh, wall. About passing. Thank you very much for an enjoyable talk. However, the question of loss and damage compensation yes. is, in my opinion, a massive red herring yep. and virtue signaling, especially in the part of Nicola Sturgeon, who went around COP26 getting selfies with everybody in their dog. They didn't get the president's dog, however. But no, on virtue yeah. signalling, we, as previous Scottish government, decided to give a shitload of money to Malawi. Yeah. And it has effectively done nothing for Malawi, as far as I know. We had Live Aid 
and we keep on having live aid every year because sending them a big bundle of money doesn't in fact compensate them because somebody just hives it off like Idi Amin. We are in fact, this audience is about nearly 300 people and we probably give a million or so pounds in compensation to Bangladesh in buying clothes from Bangladesh. That would be a far better thing than taking a big fancy photograph and virtue signaling. Uh, uh, thank you for that well articulated strong view. <laughs> um, yeah, and in many senses, I agree with you, um, or in some aspects of what you said, I agree with you. Um, so um, it is a dilemma um, within this, um, you know, that climate change, as we talked about, can be decarbonizing the world economy, avoiding the consequence of climate change. You know, the seeds of it are there in our engineering and our technologies um, uh, and in our economies, uh, uh, we can do it. But we are but the impacts of climate change, you know, so can we do that without international cooperation? Can we do that without a, an agreement between 200 countries and 200 countries turning up here to Glasgow and the next year to Sharm el Sheikh and this year to Dubai? Um, what good uh, does that do? We wouldn't actually be talking about these things uh, without this, without the 200 countries of the UN actually bearing witness to the consequences of climate change on them. The climate vulnerable countries, as they self-refer to themselves, there's about 50 of them, are small island states in the Pacific. Uh, they are least developed countries uh, in Africa. Uh, there are countries, you know, big populous countries like Bangladesh, and people are suffering there because of the consequences of climate change all the time. What are the solutions there? Well, th so let me say, this is a matter of climate justice, um, and the loss and damage discussion is raising, uh, is not only looking for, you know, funds to be, it's not looking for compensation, all right, this is a one-off compensation or reparations that's going to... Um, uh, you know, sort of solve the problem or be a you know, one-off payment to recognize that that was an injustice. Part of the discussion around loss and damage is what's referred to as recognition justice is actually for countries to put their hands up and say, yes, we have an historic responsibility and we will partner with you in whatever way through trade, through aid, um, through other sort of processes, through technological you know, um, uh, solutions to make sure that you can adapt to climate change as well as we can. And so it's actually looking for a recognition using this sort of language of loss and damage, recognition that this is a, an imposed harm uh, and a matter of, um, you know, sort of uh, a, a very, very, um, you know, almost unprecedented uh, uh, harm and injustice done to the rest of the world by a number of polluters over the last uh, couple of centuries. So I agree with you, the effectiveness of single transfers or even any funds, the adaptation funds, the green climate fund, or a, lot, or a new loss and damage funds to actually solve this is very limited. I also agree with you that many national level politicians have a lot of rhetoric on this and actually doing little about it other than taking selfies. Um, but I do think that uh, both the issue of loss and damage and the whole UN, the United Nations process is also a matter of recognition that this that we are globally interdependent, uh, but actually some of us are more responsible than others. One question from the right hand side. I fear we will have to make this the last question for those of you who are thinking of onward travel. Uh, the clock at the front, uh, it is actually ten, uh, nine o'clock rather than ten o'clock. Rest assured, despite the uh, uh, the way in which time has passed in this session. We're on Glasgow time. <laughs> I understand that in order to control immigration, um, President Trump decided to build a wall. Are such techniques liable to be adopted internationally? And have they got any chance of working? Yeah. Um, so, uh, border, so it's a question basically about border control. Does border control work? And is climate change likely to, or you know, these sort of things, uh, the risk of climate change likely to harden borders? Um, uh, I showed that that uh, around about three percent of the world's population are living in a country that they weren't born in. Um, quite a lot of researchers in this field basically say that border controls make virtually no difference uh, to this. Um, 
to these trends, um, uh, you know, at particular borders, at particular places where there's fences, there may be, you know, slightly more or slightly less um, uh, migration, but uh, that is virtue signaling to the nth, or, you know, something signaling to the nth degree, um, and that actually border controls themselves uh, make no difference to international migration flows. Um, the international, the biggest thing that's driving that's likely to drive immigration flows, for example, to Europe, is the fact that we have an aging population and we just need more working age people. And if we don't have, if we don't have increase, if we don't have population growth associated with, so we've got below replacement, you know, um, replacement fertility levels, we've got an aging population, um, and we still uh, expect to have an economy, then we're just going to import people, people of a working age. So that's one aspect to it. So border control, these sort of things are only a minor part, I think, of population um, migration policy. But another part is, do we are, are we likely to show more solidarity towards people who are leaving the places they are because of the consequences of climate change? And I would say, at least in the short term, the answer to that is yes. Lots of po sort of individual polling data in particular places around the world show that people are actually much more um, sympathetic to people who've, uh, to, to involuntary migrants, people who've had to flee because of destitution, because of the impacts of climate change, their houses just not being there anymore, their places being flooded, uh, than other migrants who, they're who still they've got negative perception of because they're assumed just to be economic migrants. So at least in places where people are moving to, like in New Zealand and Australia, there's some polling data that show that people are actually quite sympathetic to, let's call them climate migrants. Um, whether that continues, uh, it's difficult to tell, but that's certainly what it shows at the minute. And I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Well, folks, I'm sorry, we're going to have to draw proceedings to a close here. And we have had a really fascinating lecture and thank you for all your questions. Neil, we're really very grateful to you for all the insights you brought on this hugely important topic. And we wish you every success and influence in the important work that you continue to do. There are some refreshments, as usual, available in the foyer and another opportunity to keep the conversation going. Uh, I should remind you that our next meeting in two weeks' time on the 15th of November is by Dr. Gavin Francis on yet another important topic, Free for All, Why the NHS is Worth Saving. But it remains only uh, to thank you very sincerely again, Neil, and we would like to give you this rather splendid Royal Philosophical Society paperweight as a small token of our appreciation.